For more than 200 years, a small office has operated on the state floor of the White House Executive Residence. Known as the Usher's Office, its mission is to accommodate the personal needs of the first family. He or she is the individual who spends an enormous amount of time, not just around the president's family, but the president, him or herself. My guest today is Christopher Emery, the former White House usher for Presidents Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. He served 29 years in the federal government, maintaining a top secret clearance while working for the White House, U.S. Congress, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice. Today, he's a published author of two books, his memoir, White House Usher, Stories from the Inside, which details his time managing the White House and his latest wonderful mystery novel entitled White House Usher, Who Killed the President? Chris is going to join us. And boy, is that going to be a fun conversation coming up next on the Michael Steele podcast. Well, you know, every once in a while, folks, you get that blast from the past that and you go down memory lane and you remember old friendships and the battles and the and the the drinks <laughs> after the battles. Uh, and and it's it's really one of those moments for me uh, to welcome an old friend to uh, to the podcast, uh, Chris Emery, uh, noted author former White House usher, all around just a good guy. Welcome, man. Michael, great to see you. It's and you, so good seeing you. You speak of battles. I don't know that we lost any. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. We did not. We 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 won governorships and legislative races, and uh, we did all kinds of good things and a lot of fun, and it's so nice to see you. And it's nice to be able to uh, to talk about your success as someone who's been uh, inside the room uh, where it happened uh, and and be a part of America's story and history um, in the way that you served uh, both presidents and the country. Um, and I just find that very, very compelling. You've got a new book out, which we're going to get into, White House Usher, story uh story i mean sorry white house ushers who killed the president stories from the inside is the first book but the latest is who killed the president but let's start at the beginning because that's always a good place to sort of give people a feel for chris emory and your narrative um you were a white house usher which is a job that a lot of people don't know exists Correct. right tell us about that part of your story, how you became an usher, what is a White House usher, right. you know, and, and and how does it all kind of weave itself in and out of the story of presidents? Well, absolutely. And Michael, I, you know, I realized this the other day, and I don't know what made me think of it, but I am a, a real White House insider. Yes, you are. <laughs> More so than anybody else that says they are, which hopefully... After this, you'll everyone will understand why. But but the usher's office is a very unique, rare office. It's in the inside the White House. It's been around for almost 200 years. And it is actually the management office for the White House, the home of the first family, and the 18 acres of grounds that surround the house. And the ushers are there to primarily make the, that building feel like a home to the first family, not an office and not a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the ushers and I happen to be the 18th one in history. Uh, so they, they stay around for a while. They stay around a while. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I spent eight, just over eight years in the White House. I worked for President Reagan, President H.W. Bush and President Clinton. And I just had the most amazing job in the world. Uh, my job was to uh, take care of the personal needs of the president and, and first family. Right. And, and the office, as I said, has been around for 200 years. The name Usher really derived from uh, pre-colonial uh, England. Uh, the Ushers were the men that took care of the great estates of, of the, the rich and famous people that lived in, in England at the time. Um, 
So uh, fast forward uh, quite a while till when that was created. It was actually in the first floor plan of the White House in uh, 1800, 1792, actually. Uh, there was something called the Porter's Lodge, which became the usher's office. Mm -hmm. And when I say I was the 18th, there, there were uh, actually the 18th, that, that count starts from about 1845. So it, it, it's just a, an amazing job where we have a daily interaction with the first family. Uh, I get calls from the president for anything. It could be, you know, cancel my trip to uh, Camp David this weekend. Or, hey, you know what? I got the Baltimore Orioles. So I want them to come play some, you know, catch on the South Grounds. Right. I set it up. <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen. But it, but it's just it's the most amazing job that that really is is and there's not much about written about it or known about it because that's uh, the 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 privacy of the first family is paramount. And as far as ushers go, there have been three others that have written books. I happen to be the first one that's written two books. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the history of the White House, it, it's a it's a very close uh, for security and for privacy reasons. There's not much known about the house. What? So you've had three presidents that you that you were there for, um, Reagan, uh, Bush 41 and Clinton, each of those individuals and certainly their first ladies mm -hmm. um, and families writ large were very di different. Um, you know, you take a, a Nancy Reagan on one end and uh, a Hillary Clinton on the other, and then you put in Barbara Bush, who... <laughs> Everybody who who knew Barbara Bush knew, yeah, you don't mess with Mama, right? Yeah, you know, she was just <laughs> she was just that kind of very protective of of her husband and the family for sure. How how would you assess um, the personalities of the house under each of those on each of those uh, presidents and first ladies? Well, it's very different. Uh Fortunately for President Reagan, you know, it's really interesting. Reagan being older, had much older uh, department secretaries and, and directors and assistants. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain why I, I point that out. Uh, the Reagans were old Hollywood. Right. They entertained. I mean, I met Frank Sinatra. I met Jimmy Stewart. I met Gregory Peck. I mean, that, that was the crowd that they hung out with. It was pretty right. cool. Um so, and the Reagans loved uh, older music. They like Hodge, Hodge and Hart, you know, 19, right. 1930 kind of thing. Whereas, uh, you know, when President Bush came in, he was younger. Also more into, uh, as far as the celebrities, it was more into like athletics, you know, uh, Nolan Ryan. Right. Uh, you know, Herschel Walker when he was a football player or after he was a football player. Um, uh, Chrissy Everett, th things like that. And and the Bushes were a little more active. Uh, I, I should back up a little bit there. You know, President Reagan uh, went to bed late and got up at a reasonable time. And he was in the Oval Office after eight o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, there were times I would take the schedule up to the president late at night and he'd be there, uh, President Reagan, in his big government issue, black glasses, wearing a robe with a pile of papers on his lap that he's going through. And he was working till, you know, 10, 11 at night. Uh President Bush, on the other hand, would get up at five in the morning and he'd read five newspapers and then have his coffee. And he was just a little more active, a little, he was a little more, you know, the day started earlier. Right. Uh, with the Clintons and the Clintons being much younger, they were more into the 90210 era of, of celebrities. And right, things. right. Uh, but they knew how to have fun. They had a lot of parties. And uh, being younger, they had younger friends, and, and it was it was a very different White House. But the the point I make about Reagan having an older staff, you know, Michael, it was, it was Reagan's staff were there for one reason: President Reagan. Mm -hmm. They were there for the guy, and that's all they thought about. The Bush folks came in; they're a little younger, and some of them are starting to think, "Hey, you know what? I could have a real career after this." Right. And so the focus wasn't so much on on the president. Interesting. A little bit on them. Uh, the Clinton folks got in. It was, <laughs> I got to tell you, it was absolute chaos because they were very young and nobody, nobody really knew the goals or the mission until uh, David Gergen came in. And uh, you, you see David Gergen occasionally now. And see yeah. Him. Yeah. Gergen came in and he was what was really needed in that White House, you know, the, the, an adult. 
And uh, he kind of got things focused a little bit for the president. But you had guys like Paul Begala, uh, you, you had George Stephanopoulos, and, and then, of course, our friend, um, um, oh, shucks, the, the guy, Mary Madeline's husband. Oh, yeah, 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 like, yeah, uh, Carville, um, yeah, John, yeah. Carville, and you had yeah. those three guys who were, who were brilliant for the Clintons, but they were crazy. And, and so, you know, with that brilliance and energy came some missteps now and then. But those are the primary differences between first families. And I should back up to George H.W. Bush. Now, I spent all four years that he was president working for him. So I got to know the Bush family a lot better. Uh, Mrs. Bush, who was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, it was just, you know, it was very close. And so um, it was tough when they left. And uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, the Clintons brought in new energy and, and new uh, new goals and a and, and, and little bit of chaos. The Reagans were pretty stable. It's, it, it, it creates an interesting um, uh, political narrative because a lot of what you're describing is... Uh, also a lot how their administrations kind of played out. Mm -hmm. Reagan's were sort of, you know, uh, they were considered like the imperial presidency. They sort of brought back this regalness and right. this sort of formality. Uh, the Bushes were more patrician, but, you know, kind of cool. You know, they, they hung out with a lot of the folks that um, were, you know, sort of staples in, in, in various areas of economy and politics and sports um, that people feel it really felt comfortable. And that kind of translated into Bush 43 as well, you know, sort of mm -hmm. the everyman thing, even though uh, you did have this sort of upper New England kind of, you know, sort of chin up approach. And the Clintons were like, you know, Hey y'all, we're the party. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> I brought some ripple, you know, and and uh, it, it's a very and it, it kind of how their administrations played out. And so behind the scenes, you have these stories that involve. So what are some of your favorite stories about each of these presidents um, and how? Uh, because I presume, in some respects, and I'm not you know trying to be chauvinistic or anything like that, but. Uh, typically, the, the the first lady is kind of running the White House, right? She's kind of running the show around the president. Certainly, we knew that about Nancy Reagan, very protective about his scheduling, his time, who, who came in, who didn't. Um, and I assume that translated into events at the White House from very casual to very formal. Right. What, exactly. are, what are some of the stories that you remember about those times that, uh, again, not wanting to breach any... Uh, privacy or family uh, secrets, although mm -hmm. that would be good. I, I'm not going <laughs> to stop you from doing that. Um, but you've written a lot about it and you, you've you talked a lot about those uh, those events. Share some of those with us. Sure. Well, my, my first book, uh, Stories from the Inside, is really a memoir about my time. It, it, it'll teach people about the usher's office, the day-to-day -day operation. And there's some anecdotes and, and some great things I've, I've included in there, but there's nothing in that book that would ever embarrass anybody in any first family. You know, Michael, I had offers from uh, publishers, which won't be named, that offered me a six-figure uh, advance, and then they told me what I would write. Right. Mm -hmm. And I explained, well, that's not really what this is about. I I, I want to write a, a, a nice book about what this the function of this strange, obscure office and what they do and some of the neat things that we got involved with. I think each president and I have different stories and and I've I've cherished some of the private time with those each all three. Right. And that'll never see the the light of day. I'm never going to talk about any of that. But the uh you know President Reagan was was bigger than life. I mean his stature, I mean for a man that age, much younger than our current president, but uh he he actually was really in shape and, and a lot of people don't realize um, after I mean, this, this guy was still splitting wood back at his yes. at his ranch. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a little story. Um, well, after he was uh, the assassination attempt, where the bullet just missed his heart, right? One of the things they put him on was a heavy regiment of weightlifting, and so we had a universal gym right above the usher's office, and above the usher's office is the private residence. 
And by the way, if you've been in the White House, if you've been on that eight minute tour because they push you through pretty quick, right, right before you leave the front door to go out in the North Portico, if you look right to your left, right to your left, uh, behind that mahogany, mahogany door with those mirrored windows, that's the usher's office. So we're right, we're the last office serving the president that's still located in the actual house of the president. In right. The house itself. So I was telling about the um, universal gym. I could hear from my office, I could hear the clanking of when <laughs> he was doing bench presses. And, you know, I had a full universal gym with all the apparatus. And the universal gyms were, you know, what was it, 1970s, I guess. I, right, I right. Replaced by all this really cool stuff now. But the reason I'm telling you the story, President Reagan increased his shirt size by three sizes. Really? Because the mass, his chest was big and his shoulders were big. It's amazing. Wow. So he, he was in great shape. Um, but, but which actually ended up being a problem for him because when he had Alzheimer's, sadly, it took longer for him to die because he was you know, physically he was in such great shape. He was in good shape, yeah. 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 But, but back to uh, special moments. And I, write, I write about a lot of them in my book, but probably the most special moment I ever had was one week after George Bush lost to Bill Clinton. It was exactly one week later. It was Veterans Day. And the president and I, as we often would do, and, and first ladies, we were walking around the south grounds. There's a driveway that goes around the south lawn. Mm -hmm. It was dark. And the president would say, hey, walk with me. And, you know, talk about baseball. You talk about a lot of things. Uh, this particular night, he said, I want to go to the Vietnam Memorial tonight. It's the 10th anniversary of the Vietnam Memorial. And he says, you know, they read names. That they're, that they're, there's spouses of the, the, the guys that lost their life there. Right. They read their names at, at a podium at the wall. And I said, well, that sounds nice. And he says, I don't want to show up the new guy. I just looked at him because I, I don't want to do, I don't want any press. I don't want anybody knowing I'm doing this because I'm doing it for me. And I don't want to do anything that's going to make headlines over the new president. So I said, that, that sounds wonderful. And there was an agent walking four feet behind us. He called the agent up. He said, hey, um, I want to go to the Vietnam Memorial at midnight, the anniversary of the, of the wall. And uh, I don't want to motorcade. I just, you know, one car, two cars max. And the agent said, yes, sir, I'll, I'll bring a team in. And the president looked at him and said, no, you're not bringing a team in. <laughs> Look, he said to the guy, what would you do if I had a heart attack? Are you going to wait to bring a team in? <laughs> and the agent said, no, sir. He said, good, set it up. So typically my hours, I cover the awake hours of the president. And with the Reagans, it was always really easy if you're working nights because right. they went to bed at 10.30 and it was done. Um, the Bushes varied a little bit and the Clintons. Bill Clinton would be up till 3 a.m. I got I know, yeah. That, yeah. You know. So um, back to President Bush. So he goes back inside and I'm, I'm doing some stuff in my office and normally I'm gone at 10 o'clock because they'll call me up and Mrs. Bush will say, go home to your family. Right. Out of here. And there's some things I do to shut down the White House and I go home. I'm on call that night. So about quarter of midnight, I hear the elevator go up to the private residence. So I run out and I get in the elevator because it automatically opens on the floor next to the usher's office as a mm -hmm. security measure. So there's a, like a 10 second stop where I jump in the elevator and I get up and I go up the elevator. Mrs. Bush comes and the president are there and, and Mrs. Bush comes on the elevator. She goes, what are you still doing here? <laughs> and I said, oh, I've got all kinds of work I've been working on in my office. And she just rolled her eyes. And she says, do you know what Pops wants to do? <laughs> President Bush. And I said, yes, I do. And she says, we're going to go to the wall. I said, that's great. So before we do that, we're going to take a walk. And I said, okay. So I just walked out and stood at the South Portico outside on the on the driveway while they right. walked. I wanted them to have their freedom. I didn't always want to walk with them, right? Right. So they do one lap and they come around and they're going to do another lap. Mrs. Bush looks at me and says, would you like to come with us? And I didn't know if she meant walk around the, the driveway or come with them to the Vietnam Memorial. Right. So she meant the memorial. And I said, oh, my gosh, yes, I, I'd love to. So we, we walk up. There's two cars. And I figure I'm in the backup car with the agents. I start hanging that way. She goes, no, no, no. You're riding with us. Wow. And, and so they get in the car in the back seat of the giant Lincoln. And there's a little flip seat, jump seat. Yeah. Yep. Behind the passenger yep. seat. She flips it down. She says, sit here. So I was knee to knee with them as we're driving 
the only disappointment I had is they didn't use lights or sirens. <laughs> All right. That's the look as a native Washingtonian, you live for the lights and sirens, yeah. folks. That's a motorcade. That's when you got when you know you are in in the moment. That's the yeah. <laughs> so we, we we go out to the White House very quietly. We go down and, and I tell him, I said, this will be my first time to the memorial. And he looked at me and said, oh, my gosh, we can't believe you haven't been there. So we get to the uh, get up to the Lincoln Memorial and we return and we park and they get out. Now, the president's wearing a leather aviator jacket. Really looks cool. Mrs. Bush is wearing a black raincoat. It was cool, but not cold. There was no moon, no stars, and there's no press lights. So you've got this couple, and I gave them like five feet in front of me. Right. And they're, they're walking towards the, the memorial. And the president sees all these guys walking, these vets. They're wearing you know denim, and they got uh, all kinds of leather and stuff and chains. And they're walking away. They're kind of a rough crew. And he's saying as they walk by, he goes, thanks for what you did. And they just keep walking. And one guy, he slaps one guy on the back. And this guy turns around like he's annoyed. Who? And then he realizes, because by the time the guy got even with me, because I was walking, right. he's telling his buddies, that's the president. <laughs> so the president makes it up to the stage. There's maybe two or 300 people in, in the audience. And he, he asked this lady, and she was so honored to have him read the name of her husband. She was getting ready to read it. So she gave him the sheet and he, he read 10 names and then they exited. And by the time they got to the other side of the stage, there was a big crowd lined up. You know, these vets wanted to. Sure. Oh. sure. So the president's signing autographs. And, and I remember this one guy came up in a wheelchair and he had a big red beard. And uh, the, the president, he asked the president, would you sign my vest, my, my leather, my denim vest? And the president said, sure. And I remember the president saying, if you can move your beard two inches. <laughs> <laughs> so we get back in the limo. We're going to go back to the White House. And they're, they're talking a little bit. But the president's kind of lost. You know, he's kind of staring. And, and actually, I saw a tear running down his cheek. And, and we're, we're leaving the scene. And Mrs. Bush is saying, and they just that evening before this, they'd gone to uh, Union Station where Bob Dole, Senator Dole, right. had a big ceremony for the president. And so Mrs. Bush says to her, her husband, she goes, tell Chris about all the nice things Bob Dole said about you tonight. And the president's just looking out the window. He's ignoring her. And then she looks at him and sees what's going on. She looks at me. She goes, okay, I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was the... I think that was the first time I'd ever gone anywhere out of, outside of the White House with the president and first lady. And uh, so we got back. It was, you know, 1230 at night or almost it was late. And what do you I mean, what do you miss about those times? What do you miss about? I mean, moments like that, obviously, are profoundly compelling um, in in how you see the worth of your work. Um, and the appreciation of that work by the first family, because it is a very personal service that you provide. Um, it is on behalf of the country. How, how do you? How do you? What do you miss about it? And when you sit back and reflect on it now, uh, what do you think about those times? Well, I was so fortunate to be in situations where I got to witness things that no normal human gets to see, and and I guess Michael, you know, I. I've spent many years in project management and all these things after, after the White House. And where you have these project deadlines, there's a lot of pressure. Well, at the White House, the pressure is immediate. The pressure is immediate when President Reagan calls me and says, General Scowcroft or General uh, Crow is coming over and he needs an easel. Whenever Crow needed an easel, somebody was going to get bombed. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's just a little example of, of how... Um, immediate uh you have you have to respond and there's never a no to the president or a first right. lady to, we will we will get it done and just having kind of being on edge like that is 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 actually very invigorating so i miss that i miss uh being able to help you know make a difference and, and it was kind of like you know i'm the guy in the shadows that, that right gets things done so were there were there scary moments in those shadows i mean i can imagine the day reagan was was shot well you, I, you were, yeah fortunately i i'd not you started. were there after that yeah you were there after that i think but, uh during the gulf war you know we went 24 7 we were there all night 
and I was taking Situation Room bulletins up to the president. Right. And uh, when the scuds started hitting, uh, going towards Israel, remember the president, <laughs> you know, this this was 1990s. This is how far back the technology was. So I'm watching, I'm flipping from CNN in my office in the ushers. I'm flipping from CNN to, to CBS. I'm getting all the news. Right. And I'm upstairs talking to the president. He goes, what's the latest report on the scuds? And I said, well, I can tell you what CNN and CBS are saying, because that's <laughs> what I want to hear. So, I mean, the president's got is is total security staff. He's got the Joint Chiefs. He's got the Pentagon. And he's right. asking me, what's the latest on the scuds? <laughs> <laughs> but times like that were... It wasn't. It was tough because we were in a, in a in a war situation. But what was really tough was seeing the the uh, the price it took on the president. You know. Yeah. I mean, he didn't sleep, um, and and the toll I should say that it took on him. It, it was really really difficult. Are, are there any? Uh, so now you you've got and, and and I want to get because I think it kind of sets up what you've done narratively with the new book. Yeah. which is a wonderful murder mystery and and you know all the all the intrigue of you know dark wet streets in Washington DC <laughs> um which I want to get into but and and, I, and and the reason I want to have this conversation first because I think it animates what you write next in in the new book so folks knowing the the intricate details and background and experiences inside the White House it, it gives not just color, but texture to mm -hmm. the story in who killed the president. Yeah. Um, so when you when you're looking about when you're looking at that time and you're writing for this time, what what do you see as um, outdated now? I mean, things, protocols, procedures. You've mentioned the technology. You know, today we've got a cell phone that you could have said, "Well, Mr. President, here, take a look." Right. <laughs> right. Um, then you were like, well, CNN said, and or, or you know, they just reported on on ABC or CBS because there was no there was no MSNBC or no Fox, and um, at that time, right. um, what seems outdated to you when you look back on on that now? Well, that's an interesting question. Let me let me let me respond this way and see if this helps. Um, the White House thrives on the unknown. As far as the security of the of the, of the complex and, and what the capabilities are, and um, in fact, I touch a little bit on that in this book, "Who Killed the President." I think a lot of the technology's been improved, but some of the procedures haven't been. Mm. And and I was standing standing next to um, uh, what was Clinton's uh, sec Treasury Secretary um, from Texas. Um, oh, he ran, he ran for president. Um, I was standing next to him after the uh, the plane that crashed. I, this was years ago. There was a plane, a, a kid crashed a plane into the White House. Oh, I remember that. Yes. 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 Was it Benson? No, it wasn't Benson. What was his name? But anyway, I'm standing next to the secretary. And by At that time, this was before Homeland Security. So Treasury was in charge of the Secret Service. Right. And um, Lloyd. Benson. Yeah. Benson, I think. All right. So Benson. the press are yelling questions. Mr. Secretary, how close did the White House come to launching their their missiles, you know, anti-aircraft missiles? And um, he just he, he said it was under consideration. And I'm looking at him and said, there ain't no missiles up there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there might be now. I was there a long time ago, but I'm saying right, right. there are no so, missiles up there. So, so my point is, and the Secret Service told me, he says, yeah, the, the outside, they, they just fear, they don't know our capabilities. And uh, so th we thrive on that. Because well, it, 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 you know, it's, it, and it really, you know, a lot of that obviously changes after 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so there, there are those elements and aspects of it that make it um, that much more intriguing how we dealt with and existed with threats back then right. in the late 80s, 90s, um, and how we exist and deal with those threats today. Uh, and, and particularly those threats to the president, which um, we want to get into uh, in the new book. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking to uh, author and former White House usher, 
uh, Christopher Emery. Uh, more with Chris right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. We're having, I, I love these Washington conversations, this inside Washington stuff, because, it, you know, having grown up in the city, literally about four or five miles from the White House, um, it, it, it's, that was always part of my playground. My dad, every time we drove by the White House, he never failed to stop, slow down in front of the White House. You could do that then in what right. is now the plaza in front of the White House and get out and take me to the fence and show me where the president lives. So I've always had this kind of really interesting intrigue and insight uh, about, about the building and the people in the building. And you've now written a book, your second, um, uh, White House, excuse me, White House Usher, Who Killed the President, in which you um, you sort of bring a lot of that intrigue uh right right to the table which i love so just to give folks a flavor of here here's the plot as 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 uh, chris has set it up the world is rocked by the sudden death of the president of the united states almost a shocking detail soon almost a shocking detail soon emerge implicating a member of the white house usher's office the evidence seems overwhelming and the case is soon considered as open and shut if only the rest of the world knew how much more was going on behind the scenes. Now, read how Chief Usher Bartholomew Winston, a 50-year veteran of the White House, works with investigators to uncover the truth, even if that means diving headfirst into dangerous political waters to find it. I love a good dangerous <laughs> water story in D.C. It is so much fun. Tell us about this book. Um and and what what inspired the thinking behind it? I love the backdrop. The, the I mean, like as you've just described, the closeness of the White House usher to the first family, mm -hmm. the role they play, and then to suddenly have in this book uh, the principal suspect be possibly the usher himself. Oh, I had so much fun with this, and and, and it really is a who done it. Okay, uh, okay, I'll give you one hint the usher didn't do it okay <laughs> <laughs> um i i loved writing this because it was pure imagination with fact of, of of knowledge of what goes on inside the white house and and by the way i should mention all the scenes in the white house are absolutely authentic now the characters are are fiction wow okay but but, but everything that takes place is exactly how the protocol uh there's even a scene where uh, i'm not giving away too much where an assistant usher is uh, is asked by the vice president, a female, at a state dinner. Uh, she's kind of bored at this dinner, and, and she says, I've got a challenge for you. And he goes, I love challenges. She goes, get me out of the White House without anybody knowing. <laughs> and, he, and he does. And he does. And that's in the book. Um, did that actually happen at some point? That I can't say, but the, uh, the, ah. the, way, the way it was done... Um, was was possible and uh at, at least in the in the time i was at the white house i'm sure they've corrected all these things right right <laughs> but the book is so much fun there's there's lots lots of twists and turns there's a lot of action um there's some foreign uh entities involved uh where you might expect and um it's just i i absolutely adore the characters uh bartholomew winston for example a fabulous fabulous character he uh, has uncanny resemblance to Morgan Freeman. Ah, oh, okay. Which, which actually, there's a story I write in here that he's at a, uh, uh, the social office in the Reagan White House decided to have uh, Winston, everybody calls him Winston, uh, come to a party, a, a private party the Reagan's would have and just walk around with a drink because everybody would think he was Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so so he does he does this, but the trick was on him because Morgan Freeman was invited to the party. It was actually there. <laughs> so so there's a lot of lighthearted fun in this book, but there, it's obviously very serious. The president's actually been assassinated. He was he was poisoned in the White House. And, um, you know, everybody from the usher to the uh, chef to others are, are the, the White House physician to others are, are considered as suspects. And um, of course, there's this this group led by Winston uh, that's working with a, a couple other folks trying to really find out what happened. And uh, it, it, it's very exciting. I've gotten good reviews on it. 
you no, know, that's that, that that's great. I, you know, I'm already I'm already thinking. I can't wait to see the movie because yeah. you know, or, or the, it would make or, a great movie or the Netflix the Netflix uh, series. You know, yeah. it's, it's just kind of you know, Winston you become you know the, you know White House usher by day, detective by night kind of deal. <laughs> I, love well, I should it. I should mention I'm I'm now working on uh, who shot the speaker, who shot the speaker, and that'll be out this year. And that's also another who done it. Um, and some of the same characters make it's almost a sequel. I mean, some of the same characters are in both books. So interesting, sort of you know, sort of playing off of the the resolution of that, which had a had a sort of tail wagging in another direction towards uh, the but, speaker. You know, Michael, I I spent eight years in the White House. I spent eight years on Capitol Hill. And uh, when I was on Capitol Hill with the architect of the Capitol, we were also responsible for the Supreme Court. Right. So there's a pattern to my book writing. You know, we're who killed the president, who shot the speaker. Next one's going to be who killed the chief justice. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, there, you know, that that's a hot topic in our politics today, which, you know, really speaks to... Um, uh, you know, the, the nature of our, our politics. And when you look at, for example, your experience as an usher, the writing of the story, which sort of details in the context of a whodunit, um, the, the, the day in the life of the individuals in, in that work in the White House, who are part of the president's retinue, who are uh, part of his uh, security and all of that. How, how did you, how did you see, um, because we have mutual friends uh, who were still in the White House uh, during the Trump years, <clears throat> which was a very kind of topsy turvy um, uh, experience, probably a lot like Clinton's in one sense, but not so much in another. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot like in the sense that this was very different, uh, you know, particularly given the sort of state kind of traditional approach of the Obamas, and then you've got Clinton. I mean, uh, you've got. Um, uh, Trump, very much the state traditions of, you know, Reagan and Bush. And then you've got Clinton, who was kind of like, you know, a good old boy. And like you said, a younger sort of vibe and all of that. How did how did you see that? It, what what were some of the concerns, you know, scariness or just, you know, operationalizing the 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 day to day uh, for the first family for a president who was so asymmetrical in his presidency? I, it's really tough. Um, and and I figured out the other day that there's still one person left that I was I was there. I left there 29 years ago. Wow. There's still one person left from when I was there. You know, the, the staff is so professional and, and and that comes out actually in the murder mystery. You'll you'll, you'll see a lot of the staff interacting with with the, uh, the new president, which happens to be a woman. Um, so it, it, you see. Uh, they're, they're very professional. And, and actually, you know, I've met seven presidents and I've actually worked with folks. Uh, there was a guy in the White House when I was there that worked. Uh, remember seeing FDR and Churchill in the Rose Garden. Wow. <laughs> wow. But it's, wow. it's interesting because he was a great guy and, and asking him, you know, who's your favorite? And, uh, you know, the pretty much favorite over the years was Truman. Everybody kind of liked him because he was easy and play cards and, you know, he's right. Um, it, and and some of the other, uh, you know, the Camelot, the, the Kennedys, the, the staff weren't that crazy about him. Uh, they were a little aloof. Interesting. And Johnson, you know, Johnson was just, a, oh, man, he was tough. A little story. Um, Eisenhower had the farm in Gettysburg, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, right. that he'd go to. He would uh, ask the carpenters and electricians and plumbers if they had time, if they could come up and help him with some stuff. And he'd pay him. President Johnson did the same thing. Well, he didn't ask. He said, you'll be at my ranch in Texas. And he didn't pay him. <laughs> but each each of the families is so different. But yeah, you different know. between Democrats and Republicans, right? <laughs> That's a good example, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, the staff and, and some of the like the, the butlers are the front line. They're the, those are the guys in the trenches that, that are always up there with the family. And, you know. They have they have feelings, they have opinions, but you would never know it. And we never talk about stuff like that. So it, it's just, you know, we we serve uh, the, the president. And, and yes, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a butler uh, named George Haney who once joked with Mrs. Bush says, 
Um, presidents come and go, but George Haney will always be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there and there is there is a truth to that. Uh, there's a real truth to that. Um, um, because there are, I mean, there are these men um, and women who serve and have served for a long time. And, and you know, I think that was part of the, the movie, The Butler, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, how, how these individuals' lives, yeah, revolve around the president and the first lady and their families, but also how those individuals, presidents and first ladies and their families revolve around individuals like yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you described that moment with Barbara Bush, like, hey, you want to come with us? Yeah. Um, and that's that's a very special, intimate moment. That's just not Barbara being, oh, let me just be nice and make an offer. There is uh, an appreciation of the fact that you are with them and you're part of their their life in that house. And there'd be no different than if uh, an in-law or a cousin came and stayed with them. You know, you become yeah. part of the family in many respects. Do you find that? Uh, how do people in your position appreciate or not appreciate that? I mean, do some people just say, hey, it's a job, I do it? And are others like really get wrapped up in in the moment with the, with the first family? I think I think everybody stays very involved. I, I don't know if there's ever any uh, normalcy to this thing, um, but you're always you know, and not all staff are accepted by uh, by first families as we. Yeah, know. I can imagine. I went to a got, got any good stories there? <laughs> well, yeah, I would, we'll, I'll be happy to share one. It's in, in my memoir, but. Um, I went to Marlon Fitzwater's uh, book signing. He wrote one of his last books. And Marlon is with a former press secretary. Right. Great guy. Well, I got there and I was a little timid because I hadn't seen these guys in a long time. And um, I see Marvin Bush, who was the closest to my age, and we were had fun in the White House. Uh, he's talking to a, a four or five people. And I'm standing off in the distance and he sees me and he stops talking and he says to the group, he says, I want you to meet my mother's favorite son. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he you, me mean, you, you mean you got you beat out you beat out uh, Jeb, huh? There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think you know the, 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 the certainly the staff of the of the butlers and the ushers, um, and and so the butlers work for the ushers. So you know right. they're the ones with the the all the full-time access and, and often, often time access. And um, yeah, it takes a, a special person to be able to adapt and, and uh, adjust. And, and so is the president in, in, in who killed the president um, uh, a compilation of the presidents that you've worked for? Um, yes. Well, how, the, how, how is that character formed? What, what attributes um, can you point to to say, yeah, she's a little bit like Clinton here and a little bit like Bush there, et cetera? Well, I can tell you this. The uh, the president that was assassinated was a very Reagan-like. Uh, he, he had a big problem with, with the Soviets and, and now the Russians. And and, and he, was, uh, he was, his polling numbers were very good. That's discussed in the book. Uh, the vice president, very young, dynamic, uh, who happens to look a little bit like Demi Moore. Uh-huh. Uh, she, her her polling numbers are outstanding, and and she's a rock star. I mean, she's a, a Naval Academy grad. She's 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 a, uh, a she was a pilot. Uh, she's a three term uh, congresswoman, and uh, she's a dynamic speaker, wildly popular on both sides. I mean, they, right. they love her. And uh, but you get to see the real person, and and she has a very big dark side, right? As you learn in this book, um, and and she's. Uh, yeah, I'm not answering your question because you asked me which 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 president would would that person remind me of. Um, I would probably say it reminds me of someone that never became president but lived in the White House. Interesting. <laughs> um, uh, the first lady, actually, yeah, uh, yeah. Mrs. Clinton, a little yeah. bit of. Um, but uh, <laughs> as you read the book, you'll you'll see uh, you, you'll you'll be very interested in this character. I'm not going to say you're going to admire this person, but you're going to. You're going to be surprised by what you learn. Interesting. 
<laughs> Interesting. Well, look, I'm I'm all I'm all stoked um, and excited about about reading it, and 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 I'm really excited that you could come on and share a little bit of the insights to this story um, because it really it's not just uh, uh, a a murder mystery who done it, but it it really is kind of an ongoing narrative of your work. Um, in the White House in behalf of, of the American people. And as you know, sharing, you know, the protocols and, and the sort of, you know, sort of that other side of the relationship with these uh, important figures and how human they are and how much they get caught up in, in things. And, and to be a witness to that is, is fascinating as hell. Man. That, that is just an amazing, amazing story. To be able to tell that i was i was really lucky i was really lucky. my whole career how did, you, how did you get the job how did i mean I you mean, know people always your, say your background is your back i mean you weren't you weren't groomed to be the usher at the white house so. no i was i was I, I was an information technology <laughs> yeah that's i thought you were back in a um, you were a tech guy back in the day so i was actually working in greenbelt maryland and one day as a programmer they call them coders now they even change the name but i was writing computer programs and I had a copy of the Washington Post from the previous Sunday. And I'm just looking at it at lunchtime. I see this ad and I say, Executive Office of the President, Office of Administration, and Reagan White House in search of computer automation specialist. Now I'm thinking, man, I've got to get a rejection letter from the White House. How cool would that be? <laughs> right? I actually printed out my resume and this was 1985. So it was on a dot matrix printer. I still have it. I have the. I found it in the archives. The, the I letter, love it. Letter. And my letter was all in caps. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I, I mailed. But you were the, screaming. You were screaming <laughs> your qualifications to the president. So this was August eighty-five, or September or August of eighty-five. I mailed it in, and I was thinking, I can't wait to get this letter because I'm going to show my buddies in the office. Look who's writing to me, right? Oh I wouldn't let goodness. them see the letter. It's just the letterhead, the White House. So. I forgot about it until uh, December one day when the phone rang at home. We're at dinner and my stepdaughter answers the phone. Her eyes get really big as she hands me the phone. The phone's one of those wall phones. you know. Oh, wall. I remember with the long cord. Yeah. She hands me the phone and she says, it's the White House. I'm like, what? So I thought, should I, who should I answer this as? I could be Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I could <laughs> do a funny, you know, this is Jimmy Carter. I could do somebody or Ronald Reagan. Um, I answered, hi, this is Chris Emery. And the lady started reading for my resume. And I thought, this is real. I love it. So I actually, I interviewed, this was in uh, December. I interviewed uh, early January and they hired me. And I started, uh, I started mid-January 1986. And for the first year, I was in the office of the president. And then I ended up fought, getting into the job where I managed the White House residence, the home of the first family. Right. I, because they had an opening and I was doing some work over there and, and, and I ended up getting that job. But yeah, everybody says, who'd you know to get your job? And I said, I didn't know anybody. Right. I just, I just <laughs> sent in a resume because I saw an ad in the newspaper. <laughs> so, so, so my plan, my plan for a joke backfired. I, I never got the rejection letter. Never got the reje Yeah. But you got a little bit better than that. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that's, that's how a good story ends. That, that is wonderful, man. Well, Chris, I appreciate you coming on, man, and taking some time with us and sure. sharing sharing the insights. Uh, the book is White House Usher, Who Killed the President? Uh, it's out now. Grab a copy, sit back with a glass of vino and enjoy it. It, it, is, it is a great Washington whodunit. Um, you, will, you guys will, will love it. You can follow Chris uh, on Twitter at White House Usher. And, um, you know, track some of the things he's doing as he's getting ready to write a, a new book or is in the process of writing a new one. I'm a third uh, of the way through it. And I was working on it right before we started this this call. So uh, I should mention my book is also available. The, the, the murder mystery is also available in uh, Audible. Ah, and yes. The reason, reason I push that is there's so many characters in this book and the narrator was so good. There's a scene in my book that I actually flash back to something that occurred in the in the Nixon White House. It's a great story, which is true. Um, but the narrator does Nixon better than Nixon. I mean, this guy is great. So if you, if you like Audible, if you're driving a lot or you know walking a lot, get get the Audible version. I, I should mention my first book's in Audible also. 
Yep. And I was going to say the the first book that started the storyline was uh, White House Usher Stories from the Inside uh, by Chris Emery. Uh, check out both books. Um, get the Audible. I love the Audible too. I, I love, yeah. particularly when you've got good narration. Yeah, it just it just great. draws you further into it, and you actually feel like you're talking or at least listening to the candidate of candidates mm -hmm. to the to the uh, the characters in in the book. So, but uh, Chris, I wish you all the best with it, man. Thank you. And uh, keep writing, and we'll keep reading. I really appreciate it, Michael. I, I'm so glad to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. You take care of yourself. All right. uh, folks, that does it for our little bit of time together. I really hope you got a lot out of this. It was a great conversation with Chris Emery. Again, check out the book, uh, White House Usher Who Killed the President. Uh, it's out now. Get the Audible version as well if you like that. And um, you know, check us out on Twitter at Michael Steele, the podcast at Steele underscore podcast. And do the download thing. Tell your friends about what we're doing over here. We're having a lot of fun. It's just good conversation and uh, every once in a while, I would like to bring some stuff that you otherwise wouldn't know about or hear about. And uh, this is one of those because it's it's good stuff out there. And we want, want you to be a part of uh, at least understanding the rest of the story. And Chris has got some good stories to tell, and it's all in the book. So until next time, be safe, be well, and God bless. Mm -hmm.